Wait, wait, what is this shit? The Not Safe for F***ing Worker Placement Podcast. I flipped the board. I despise that game. Oh, oh f- that. That's how much- Oh, wait, wait, wait. Hello and welcome to the 19th episode of the Not Safe for Worker Placement Podcast. A board game podcast brought to you by me, Leandra. And me, Ben. We're married, and we're here to talk shit about board games. Yes, we are. Episode 19, here to talk shit about the board games. And in this episode, get your ball gags, your felt-lined handcuffs. What are ball gags? And I'll put on my gimp suit, because we're talking role-playing. Oh, but wait. You don't know what a ball gag is? What is a ball gag? It's those balls that go in your mouth, and you put like the horse uh, bridle on, you know? I am. We did it the other night. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't worry about it. You you don't need to know what it is. <laughs> anyway, no, not that kind of role playing. We're going to talk RPGs in this episode. Nice. We've been threatening to do an episode like this for a long time, and um, this one sort of is not what I really wanted to do for this episode. So we may do another one, maybe even next episode, uh, maybe like a continuation, um, because I wanted to you know, do a few RPG sessions leading up to this. And we just, with the move and everything, we haven't had time to actually do that. Tried to schedule one and, but we actually have some coming up. So after this episode is done, we're going to be doing some RPG playing. Um, and we might either report on that or might just do like an RPG part two episode or something, uh, very soon. So babe. So what have you been up to lately? We've been moving. We are recording in a new house. Mm-hmm. Whoop, whoop. In a new tiny game room. Yes. Where he's got his games and his podcast recording stuff set up in what will one day be my workout slash spare room. But for right now, it is the game room. It'll it'll suffice for now. It's it will. It pretty works. full with the games and the table. There's like zero room. I've got a few guitars in here. Um, but it's pretty much packed to the gills already. Yeah. So, we'll um, make it work. it's temporary, but it actually, I think is working pretty well for a recording studio. seems pretty quiet in here. Um, so the move is done. We're moved in. What do you think about the new house, babe? We've been I, talking I people's it. ear off about this for months now. I love it. I'm so glad we made the move. What about you? Oh, you know, my opinion. You said you liked it. <laughs> No, I like the place. I just, I hated the moving and I I hate not, I just hate not being settled yet, even though, I mean, it feels like a home now. It's just that, you know, I've got a lot of work to do to get things the way that I want them, which is what I didn't want to do. But, you know, that's the way things work. So. I love it. What do you love about it? I love the location. I love that when we go outside, there are no streetlights. I love that we are the rowdy people on our street. We're the only people under 70, I think. We're the only people under 70. I love that across the street is just grass and trees. That's mm-hmm. fabulous. Okay. And I just love it. I love everything about it. Awesome. Well, that's it for that. You don't have to hear any more about us no, moving. we're done with moving. Nobody gives a shit about that, but we've no talked about one. it forever. And that's the last you'll hear about it. Okay, done. Unless the house burns down, we have to do it again. Yeah. Uh, in which case, you know. Don't look my way. So <laughs> anyway, no, it's like, it's like an adventure every day because something is like trying to figure shit out. Like the cat had went crazy when we moved in and then today our dog ran off and we had to go chase him down. It's just like nothing, nobody settled here, you know, like at our old house we had a, we had a fence. Now he still did run off sometimes there. He would get under the fence and run away. But you know, it was like today it was just like we turned our backs and then, oh, hey, what happened to Max? Oh, he's a mile down the road now. <laughs> oh, great. Fucker. Let's go catch him. <laughs> so, you know, it's just like, it seems like it's been a nonstop roller coaster for like the last month and I want to get off. I'm, I'm ready, ready to settle. But that's not happening. Uh, we've got Moon City Con coming up in uh, one, little over one week now. Super excited. Um, that 
will be another big uh, load off my shoulders once that's done. I'm excited for it. Now there's a lot of people uh, in our planning committee that are just ready for it to be over with at this point. But I am like, this is the point where I get excited because I know it's going to be, it's going to be fun. It's going to, it's going to work well. It's going to be great. I'm just excited for it to get here. I'm not excited for it to be over. I'm excited for it to get here. Then once it is over, you know, there'll be one less thing to uh, have to stress about and look forward to. Um, Speaking of which, I'll move and segue right into plugs because that's something we got to get out of the way up front. So we'll start out and we'll plug Moon City Con. Go to www.mooncitycon.com. Get your tickets uh, and T-shirts and whatever else you've got a little over a week to buy in. It's in Springfield, Missouri at the Oasis Inn and Convention Center. Uh, going to be nothing but two days of open gaming, vendors, giveaways, prizes, uh, tournaments, you name it, we'll have it. We're taking the best things from all the uh, big cons and putting them into a small con, and hopefully uh, it'll just be the first of many. After that, go check out more of our content at nsfwppodcast.com, where you can find downloads to all of our podcast episodes You'll find links to Apple Music, Google Play, YouTube, Stitcher, and any other way you would like to consume your podcasts. That's it for plugs. Plugs over. Now, move on to... What we've been playing recently. Which is not a lot. No, it's not. Seems like we've been saying that lately, but um, we've got some gaming in here and there. Um, We're going to just pick the best of uh, several games that we've played I've played a bunch without you, and honestly, when we were sitting down here, I was like, nothing's sticking out in my mind. Like, I think I've forgotten a bunch of games. But um, what we played together, first off, was Azul. This is a new abstract game by Plan B Games, designed by Michael Kiesling. It's, I say abstract, it's got a theme about laying tiles in these Spanish, uh, I don't know, palaces or something, but... Really, it's themeless. It's it's just about it's an abstract game about making patterns on a grid, right? Yeah. But it's got cool like plastic um, tiles. The tiles are like uh, thick square, you know, pieces about one inch by one inch or so. I'd say. Um, what do you What do you remember about Azul, babe? I remember all the different color tiles, mm-hmm. and I remember that um, there are two sides to the board. One side of the board has a pre-laid graph for you. That way it already shows you that you can't mix your different color tiles in the same row in the same column. Or the other side is for the more advanced players where there is no pre-laid graph and you have to figure it on your own, which to me sounds horrible. So I think we'll stick with the pre-laid one. Yeah, I I would like to try the other side. I haven't yet, but because I'm terrible at this game, um, how it it works is that's pretty good babe thank you um how 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 it actually all um unfolds is you well that's a stupid way to say it. here's how you here's how the game unfolds babe. unfold God, unfold I'm it babe not on my game tonight um so basically here's how the game plays you've got uh these five different colored is it five or six shit i don't remember there's like three blues a yellow a red I and think a black there's five but i could be wrong five different types of tiles uh colors so um, and they're all in a bag, right? And you've got these little round coasters that go out in, in the middle of the table, and depending on number of players, you Which put a different number of those out there. really needs to be hyped up a little bit to little round bowls like you have in uh, uh, Century Spice Road. Oh, Century Road. Spice Road. That wouldn't be bad, actually. Yeah. I just remember the name of the game. Okay. It, it was fine until you pointed it out, because it's literally your job here. But I'm... <laughs> <laughs> and we <laughs> probably it. talk about that game every every single episode. So, yes. Pat you on the back when I can reach you. Thank you. Um, but anyway, well, that's by the same company too. So, oh, are they? Um, yeah. Oh, but the yeah. So the, you got these these little coasters, these little round like beer coasters out on the table, and each each one of those will get four of these tiles drawn out of a bag on there randomly, and then uh, first player gets their pick of one color on each of the tiles or on each of the coaster, on one of the coasters, excuse me. So you have to pick a coaster, and you take one color off of there, and you take every tile of that color. So say there's two blacks, a uh, red, and a yellow. If I want those two blacks, I have to take both of those two blacks. And the, the red and the yellow will get pushed to the middle, in, in the middle of all of these um, coasters. So 
that then becomes a community pile, which anyone can take all the co- all of one color out of there if they wish to. But there is a first player marker that's in there, which is a special tile. And the first person to pick out of that middle pool has to take that, which counts as negative points at the end of the game. Because what you're doing with these tiles is whenever you pick them up, you've got to immediately place them on your board. And you basically there's a system of this. Uh, you've got these uh, spots on the left side of your graph that you can put um, your tiles before the end of each round. You, you line them up there and the top one has one spot and then there's two spots, three spots, four spots and five spots. Um, you have to lay one color in each of these these like prep areas until you have that row full and then you can put a different, uh, you know, that same color somewhere else or a different color in these different uh, prep areas. Then after everybody's gone around and selected all these, then that's when you actually are playing, you know, you're actually building your, your tile floor or whatever, or wall. And you're taking each of these colors that are lined up in your prep area. You take the very first one, slide it over into um, the graph into the corresponding spot. And like Lee said, you can never have um, the same color tile in a row or a column. So you're, you're basically doing that and then you score and you score by how many tiles they're touching whenever you lay them. So you're moving them over from this prep area and you're putting them on your board and depending on how many they touch in the rows or columns that they're in, they'll score one point for each one of those. So say you touch uh, orthogonally uh, one more tile in a row and then two tiles in a column, you're going to score one, two for the row and then one, two, three for the columns. You get five points for that particular tile. That right there didn't really click with me until the second game. Uh, The first game, I was so uh, focused on not getting stuck with extra tiles. Yeah, because what happens when you get extra tiles? Then they go to the negative, the negative section, the bottom of the board. Thematically, they they fall to the floor. Yeah, they fall to the floor and then they're worth negative points at the end of the round. And so the first game, I was so... um, so concentrated on um, only pulling the tiles that were the exact amount to fill my graph and not thinking about, oh, well, I need my tiles to be touching, so I need to try to get them color corresponding so that every everything touches for the maximum amount of points. I totally screwed myself over and Toya kicked our ass, well, my ass anyway. But well, She kicked my ass too. <laughs> I have never won a game of this game. It's a fun game, it, it, and, it's, and you can, there's a, it's, it's simple, but you can really use different strategies oh, to yeah. try to figure out which way you really want to go for it. You do want to go for just the colors or the, or the, or the, the, the graph system itself or, you know, what's, what's the actual, you know, well, you have to plan to group them. You have to, you have to get the yeah. plans. you like, okay, when I play this tile, I'm going to be touching a whole shitload of other tiles. That's, that's the whole key. And I haven't figured out how to do it. And I, I know what I'm doing wrong now after about my fifth game, I see what I'm doing in every game is like, I'm focusing on taking, one tile at a time just to be the one right tile instead of grabbing like the three blue ones that are out there because I don't need them right now, you know, and I'm afraid to get one extra or whatever. Then I'm just taking this one red because I need, you know, four reds and there's only one red out there. So I don't want to let that red go by. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, and everybody else is grabbing four, three, four tiles a turn, you know, and I'm grabbing one little tile and thinking I'm doing well. It never works out very well. So I, I this is one of these games like I'll play at any time, but I'm not good at it. And I've tried to like not care and just play loosely and willy nilly, and I don't do well. I've tried to be really strategic, and then I don't do well. Sounds I don't, like Splendor for you. I just yeah, it except Splendor. I hate this game. I will play. <laughs> this game is fast, and yeah, I mean it is. It sort of does have that same Splendor thing for me, where it's like I see what's happening, and it's simple, and it's not hard to play, but I just am not good at it, you know. And and unlike Heaven and Ale, which we talked about before, mm-hmm. like Heaven and Ale, really you know, boggle my mind about how to do well on it, but it called to me to come back and try it again, you know, and eventually it clicked with me. This game is just, there's so much randomness in it about, you know, like what's available at all times. It's like, I feel like I don't think this, it's very random in the way Splendor is. And I don't know if it'll ever click with me. I just think this is one of those games that's not in my wheelhouse. You know, I lose to, I'm always the last in every game I've played. I've came in last. you were. So I don't know. I like it though. I think it's fun. I mean, it's a it's a clever little game, a very simple idea. Yeah, it was fun. That you know makes for a, a clever little game. But it's 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 super hot right now. It's it was sold out for a while. It just oh, came really? back into print, and now okay. it's about to be bought out again. You know, it's about to be sold out again. So you know, it everybody's got a copy of it. Uh, we're gonna do a tournament of that at Moon City Con too. Ooh, we just I bet Toy would that. like that. So we're gonna do a con, uh, uh, a tournament and give a copy away. So. 
I don't know. That's Azul by Plan B Games. Uh, good game. Mm-hmm. Agreed. Uh, I suck at it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then we played with your aunts and Lily the other day. I picked up this game specifically as a family game. It was a Kickstarter game, and I and I didn't get it on Kickstarter for whatever reason. I thought about it and let it pass by, but I got a copy, I think, on eBay, pretty cheap. Um, it's called A Dog's Life, designed by Christoph Bollinger, and self-published, like I said, on Kickstarter. Um, a Dog's Life, okay? Cool premise to a game. You're you're all dogs of different breeds, and your job you're you're like street dogs. You know, you got no home, so you're roaming the streets. Trying to find bones. First person to get three bones and take them back to your den wins the game. Um, I th- I'm, I'm leery to give my opinion on this because you said that there are other rules to the game that we didn't we Well, didn't we didn't use. play it right. We didn't play it right. So I'll say right away I was disappointed in it. I thought yeah. there was going to be more to it. I mean, I wanted it to be a simple family game, but I also thought that it was one of those games that can be, you know, like, like, Dixit and and things like that that can be enjoyed by kids and by adults, but it was so light that it was know, very light. There wasn't really much to do as far as decisions, and I played a rule wrong, which which gave us what tr- less what tool actions. Was it? Well, basically, okay. Here's how a dog's life works. Oh yeah, no. When we got captured, we were yeah. supposed to be able to have a turn. That's so right. basically, each dog, depending on their breed and their and their. Uh, you know, ability they they have a certain number of action points, which already is problematic because if you tell there are certain games that have that have this mechanism, and there's usually a sweet spot in those. It's usually like about six. After about six actions, it becomes hard to keep track of what you've done unless you have some way of tracking. You know, the the actions that you're taking, and in this one, you know, like my dog had eight actions that it could do. You know, you're you a lot of times are backtracking. Okay, I did this. That was one. That was two. That was three. So it's hard to keep track of that. First of all, I don't like that having that many actions without a way to track it. So you got eight actions on your turn, let's say, and the you can choose to um, move, and each each spot you move is an action. You can pee on lanterns, which mm-hmm. marks your territory, um, and then any other dog, if they, if they enter that space, they have to stop because that immediately, they have to stop and smell the other dog's pee, and that ends their turn. The rest of the actions are gone. So you're blocking off parts of the board with your pee. Then you need to drink wet water fountains on spaces, which takes an action in order to fill up your bladder with your with your pee. Um, and then you can also go to um, the trash cans, trash cans, and search those. Which you're, that's that's where the main mechanism of the game is. Everything you search, you can either search trash cans um, or restaurants, and you flip over this car a card. Each dog has their own deck, and they're different depending on the type of dog. Some dogs are better at certain things than others. You flip over a card and it tells you what you found depending on what you're doing. Like if you're begging at a restaurant, you might find food or you might get nothing or you might find a bone or in a trash can, you might find food, you might find nothing, you might find a bone. And it all just depends on that card that you flip and each one of those things take an action. Um, or you can fight another dog. If you're adjacent to another dog, you can fight them, which flips over. you flip over a card and you have these number of bite symbols and whoever has the most, you know, um, wins the fight. Also, at the end of your turn, after you've used up all your actions, you roll a die and then move the dog catcher. There's a cool little dog catcher miniature. Now, one thing I will say for the game, it's cool looking. Like, the board is nice. The board is nice. The, and dogs, I love the, miniatures. the little dog miniatures are painted, pre-painted, yep. and they all have, you know, little hats on and stuff and a little personality. The presentation of the game is really cool. And there's a little dog catcher miniature. So you move the dog catcher, and you can, you're trying to, of course, capture the other dogs. This didn't feel good in this game either because it's so light and you're playing with kids and, you know, like, and it's like, there's that classic take that thing of, oh, now I'm going to go screw you and I'm going to get you into, like the dog catcher should be random. I think it should have its own pre-program movement it should. You rather than be you res- choosing yeah. it because that's just dickish, you know? Yeah. And so that kind of, I didn't like that part. I just didn't care for the game. No, I didn't either. And I was sad because I wanted to. But what I did wrong was, okay, if you also, you have to find food or else every turn you get hungrier. And if your hunger thing gets down to your food supply gets down to zero, you pass out at the beginning of your turn and you have to go to the dog pound. Or if the dog catcher catches, you have to go to the dog pound. Then it's this thing of you're flipping these your cards to see if you escape the dog pound. If you don't, you move down these steps. When you get out of the dog pound, you're supposed to have your whole turn 
and I played that wrong. I thought all you did on your turn was get out of the dog pound. So that happened to all of us at least once and some at of least, us twice. Yeah. So that would have been a whole nother set of actions because what happened like in the whole game, Lily was so bored she only because she only took two turns in the whole game. Mm-hmm. You know, and one of those turns was to lose all of her shit because <laughs> she got yep. she fell asleep and lost all her stuff. So like, I don't know, it just it was too light and it didn't have enough. It wasn't captivating to enough. Captivate you. It yeah. wasn't. It, 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 and it, I think that's sad because it's such a cool package. Like there could be a good game in there, you know, but it just wasn't, it just wasn't there. No. Nope. I would give it one more shot to try to play with the right rules, you know, and see if it's any good. But I don't see this one sticking around very much. No, nope, so. me either. That was a dog's life. After that, what do we play, babe? Uh, Via Nebula. Yeah. Uh, Via Nebula, I do not have the producers. Or oh, the the, uh, the designer is designers. Martin Wallace, and it is uh, published by Space Cowboys. The first thing I'm going to say about this game is the artwork is amazing. Yep. Every Space Cowboys game is beautiful. Space Cowboys made Splendor. They make um, Elysium. Um, the, every game that they make has just beautiful artwork and components and this is no different no it, it's it's so pretty the the cart the 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 player boards are pretty and yep the characters are very neat and they're all personalized and they just i don't know they just they're so just I, really neat it has some kind of weird fantasy theme where you're like uh living in this world that's covered in fog and you're trying to uh create these paths through the fog and to contrast it with another martin wallace game like uh, that we played Brass, you know. Mm-hmm. It's another train game of Martin mm-hmm. Wallace. This is essentially a train game, even though there's no trains in it. You know, just think of Brass, which, like I said, we talked about this, is going to have the new version. Sure. Um, but, like, how much different the artwork, difference oh, the gosh, artwork yeah. makes. Like, this is essentially the same type of game. It it's is. much, much lighter. Yes. Much lighter. But, you know, it's the same, you know, this game has just a coat of paint on it that belies what the game actually is, right? Yes. So I would call it overproduced for the game. Um, what do you think about Via Nebula? The game itself, I, mm-hmm. it was it was fun. I, I liked it. Was like you said, it was a uh, much lighter version of Steam or or Brass. Um, but I enjoyed it because you know we hadn't played games in a while, and so it was kind of like our first, my first one, kind of back in besides you know Dog's Life and Azul, you know. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I I enjoyed the little. The little thingies, what are those things? I call them machines. They're not called machines. Oh, the buildings? The buildings, yes. Yeah. Because they all have that, the little wooden characters. And I, I yeah. always enjoy more when games have the, the actual pieces rather yeah, than this cardboard. This one has, for the four players, they all have, like, so you're basically, you're, you're playing a little, I don't know, like a clan, a type of type of uh, people in this land. So you have your own uh, little buildings that you're building. Um, I guess I should basically say how the game plays. The game is, like I said, it's a train game in a way. It's also a resource. It's not really a train, but it's a pathway well, yeah, game, but, I guess. Know, it's just the same thing you're doing in Steam. Yeah. That you're doing here. Um, it's basically a Steam light with way better components, um, except it's got this idea of, and, and the spin that he put on it, and I heard a little interview with him talk about how this game got produced. Um, he said he took a different game to the uh, to the publisher Actually, I think this is on the, I think I didn't hear this in an interview. I think this is actually on the back of the rule book. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> he uh, he said he took a different game to show them and they weren't really into that game and he had been working on this game, just barely started working on it and he, and he shot them the idea and they're like, okay, we like that. And the idea came from what if we had a game where, you know, what you do can benefit your uh, your opponents more. Because in Steam, I mean, you can use people's um tracks but that that helps them immediately you know what i mean like it doesn't just help you it helps them um in this game you know you build paths and they're just wide open to anybody yeah, there's no there's no them. detriment for using them so basically what you do is you've got um you've got five actions you can choose from you can either um lay a tile which is a path sort of like a track so we're just going to call it track you can lay a track or you can um, put down a building site, which there are certain spots on the board that uh, can be built can be building sites. You put down one of your color building sites, and then 
or you can go to an exploitation spot, which are these spots on the board, these round disks that have certain types of resources printed on them. You go, you can put down one of your workers, one of your three workers down there, and then put when what happens is you put your worker down, and then you take off that disk and you put down the actual resources. So there's there's pigs and brick and wood and stone and wheat, and so you would say say and they're the, actually little wood pieces and they're also too. little little they're fun. little people little meeple pieces for that. Um, you can so say there's uh, three wood at this spot. I would remove that that round tile, take that. It has points on them, and the more resources, the more points they have. You take that and you put it next to your board because that's your points. Um, and then you put your worker down there and you put those resources down there. Now what happens is your worker is stuck there until those resources are gone from that tile. He's working that place. Like he's 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 cutting down the wood or he's making the bricks or he's tending the pigs or whatever, you know. And then what you got to do is build paths out from there to your building spot. So your buildings are uh, represented by these contracts on the board, right? Um, there's some There's some public ones and then everybody has two private ones at the beginning of the game. So uh, you can fulfill these by an action, um, having all the stuff that you need on those building uh, sites of your color. So say if uh, I got something in my hand that says I need a brick, a stone, and a pig, and it's going to give me three points, and I get to build one of my buildings. So I would I would connect paths from a stone, a brick, uh, whatever I said, <laughs> a stone, a brick, a pig, uh, and then I will spend one of my actions to deliver goods to a completed path. Now there's some monkey wrenches thrown in here because there's some spots that are petrified forests, which take two actions of your, because you take two actions on your turn. Um, it takes two actions to build a path over a petrified forest representing it's, you know, harder to cut down petrified wood to get through there. And also if you end up with, with more resources than you need to fill a, uh, what was it a called? Contract. A contract then you have to take those resources and put them in a negative point spot on your board. And so you really have to have um, extra... And how that might happen is like, say you're going for one of those public ones and you're putting those resources on your building, but then but then somebody else comes right in front of you and scoops that one up. So you, then you've got resources that you can't use, right? So continue, sorry. That's okay. Um, and so you, you have to be able to have multiple... Um, what are they called? Not machines, buildings, multiple buildings at once so that you can deliver the, the same good that requ- that's required for each contract to multiple buildings or else you're stuck with all these negative points. So That or your dude's just going to be, if you can't build a bunch of buildings, then your dude's just going to be stuck dude, there yeah, with the resources. Yeah, you only have three guys. So you kind of yeah. want to get your guys out of there. So you have to get all the resources, resources out of there. I don't think either one of us ended up with negative, did I we? I had one. You had yeah. one? Because I, I, I just did something wrong. Like I... I put the wrong resource on on a spot. Oh. I was thinking I was trying to build something else, and then I was like, "Oh no, I got to build this other one." So or you might have built one out from under me. See, in a two player game, there wasn't there wasn't much interaction, which I thought was a big part of what was this game was supposed to be. Because there's there's a different setup for more than two players. What happens is you get half. Um, you get instead of having full hexagon for your building site, you get a half of a hexagon. So two point five a gone. See, I think that two point five. You get a two point five a gone, <laughs> and then you put that on a building site, and then you can either go on another turn and put another one of your halves there, or someone else can build that half, and then you're competing to see who can finish that first. Why can't we do that now? Like with a two player, it just, it just won't work. I assume because, because there's be, no reason. Because it'd be so many more options. Well, available. and it kind of became the way that the resources were spread out because they get randomized at the beginning of the game. And the way it worked out is we really didn't have to interact with each other. You Not had at enough all. resources on your side, and I had enough resources on my side to I do my like buildings. I feel like it would be a way more of an awesome game because it already is a great game. Yeah. But if we had to interact more with each other and and go yeah. on each other's paths more and get more of each other's resources and well, some games are just some games are just better with more players, mm-hmm. you know. And I think this game might be that. Or there is another side to the board. We played the beginner side. Oh, there's I didn't another know that. side to the board that has more pathways. So, like the stuff, there's less, uh, there's less uh, oh. resource spots and stuff. Is that a two player board? Yeah, you can play it with either one. Um, it's just harder because you have to build more tracks and stuff, and it might encourage you know using each other's uh, pathways. Ooh, let's more try that stuff. next time. So yeah, because I really like the game. I did too. It was just very simple. I found it very. I found it with two players. It was just kind of we were doing our own thing. So there wasn't much. 
you know, it was still fun to try mm-hmm. to do the thing. And there's still a little bit of a puzzle of how to do that the most efficiently because it's kind of a race game. And a two-player, it's more of a race game. Um, because, I mean, you're always looking to build whoever builds their fifth building first ends the game, but you don't necessarily win. Now, in this case, you, you built your fifth building first and you won by two points, you know. But there, it was just like it was possible that I could have scored more points on that because I got one more. Everybody gets one more turn after the person who ends the game. Mm-hmm. So you get this card that's worth two points for ending the game, but then everyone else at the table gets another turn. Well, it was just me. I had two actions and I wasn't able to build anything that was going to give me enough points. But still, that being said, I really like the game. I would really like to try it with that advanced board. Me too. And even with more people, you know, because even with three or four, you go with those half hex sizes instead of oh, instead of shit, full get ones. Crazy. Which because then it's going to either it's going to take you longer to build first of all because you got to put use two actions to get a building site out, or you use one action to get a half one, and then you come and jump on it because you're like, okay, that's close to the yeah. resources that I need, so I think I can Ooh, build it faster like than him. Fun. So that's Via Nebula by Martin Wallace. Martin Wallace continues to be one of my favorite designers and he's getting better and better. I'm going to mention real quick another Martin Wallace game that I just got and I played um, like a couple weeks ago. I was really itching to play this. It's called The Arrival and it just got brought out by of all people Cryptozoic Games. Uh, Cryptozoic uh, infamous for putting out pretty terrible games like they made the Ghostbusters game which I was so excited for and I went all in on the Kickstarter and then I played the game and I was like oh it's a shitty version of Zombicide but at least I have uh, cool Ghostbuster miniatures um, I've been told that the Ghostbusters 2 version which I did not fall for and did not kickstart and now can't seem to get a copy of um, I am such a Ghostbusters nerd that I will have to get it even though I think the game sucked but they did say that I've heard some people say that it does improve upon the game so i would like to at least try that but cryptozoic is bringing out the first of, that i know of straight up euro game from martin wallace which is a really odd pairing but martin wallace has kind of shown that he'll work with anybody if somebody says they're going to publish his game he's like go for it it was already out in europe um the european version was uh i, I was going to get a hold of it it was much more expensive it was like 60 dollars to get it and it had very very like uh, what's that called neutral colors like a uh, neutral color palette like it was very bland looking you know and this version they really bumped up the color palette a lot changed some of the artwork and like the box cover is super ugly i didn't like that but the card artwork and stuff and the board artwork is better than the original i've been told by people who have played the original so what the arrival is is it's not a train game. Yay, it's Martin <laughs> Wallace. Not a train game. It's sort of a uh, play off of some of his other games, like A Few Acres of Snow or Mythtopia. Um, it's not as much of a deck builder, but it has that same map element. So you got this map of ancient Ireland, and it's this uh, kind of fairy tale about you're the you're the humans trying to fend off these things called Formorians, which are like these old Irish folktale monsters, right? They're like trolls. And they're coming to invade. And they're coming down from the, the north part of Ireland in these castles that they have. And they're moving out. And basically, the, the crux of the game is this cool little uh, resource gathering thing where there's these three different types of cards, three different decks of cards you can draw from to get your hand up. And then you uh, shuffle up your deck and you and then or your hand. And then every turn, everybody reveals a certain number of cards. It's like four cards. You reveal the first two and then... Each one, what you do is you have this black marker thing and you'll block off a row. So each card has three rows. One will have, uh, and, and, and what you do is you have to choose one that you're not going to take, right? So you have this black marker, this blocker thing. And you're like, okay, I've turned over these two. I'm not going to take the top row of either one of these two cards. Then you turn over one more and you block another one off. So then you're leaving yourself with, you know what you're going to get off of three of these cards but you don't know the rest and that then you've committed to that third row and you turn over the final card and you see what you've gotten. And then you gather all your resources, which can be like swords and shields and, and, uh, corruption and points and the corruption. You take that as a, as a uh, chits plus for every corruption you have, you have to take one of these Formorian dudes or no, you, you take corruption on the board. It's like a track. And then you also have to take one of these Formorian tokens and only you can see what you get. You draw them off a pile randomly, and then you look at them, and they've got certain strengths on them. And then 
your your whole t- round is not over until you do all your actions with your with your supplies that you've gotten you know on your turn you go fight stuff or you build uh, buildings on the board or whatever but you can't end your turn until you've placed out all of these four morians that you got so say you got eight corruption you got to put out those dudes on the board somewhere now maybe that's good because you want to fight them and you're like i got ones i'm gonna put them close to me so i can fight them you know and get points for beating them or i got this big strong one i'm gonna put them right over here by Catherine so that she has to fight them or whatever and hopefully she doesn't have enough swords but ultimately it's this weird push pull thing that which he does in his scoring just like in a study in emerald where the score track is moving back and forth and that triggers the end of the game this one is the same way. You've got victory points and a corruption track. And the end of the game is signaled by either two ways, somebody reaching a certain point on the corruption or somebody reaching a certain point on the um, victory points. And then you look at the number of uh, settlements that the humans have on the board versus the number of the Formorians that are on the board, and that will determine who wins because if the Formorians have more people then the person who is least corrupt wins the game. But if the humans have outnumbered them, then the person who has the most victory points wins. So it's this push-pull. You know, at the end of the game, it comes down to maybe you want to dump the whole board full of the bad guys because you have the least corruption and you're way back on the points. So you want to make sure that there's more bad guys on the board than good guys. It's this really cool thing. The whole game you're watching, you're always counting how many bad guys are out there. Do which which way do I want to go? Do I want to get a bunch of points and try to run away from everybody, or do I want to you know and then get get a whole bunch of corruption because it won't matter because I'll you know I can kill them. Do you own that? Yeah, I've got it. Oh, we should play it. It's pretty. Yeah, that I think you'll like actually fun. like it. It is fun. But we played it to point. Catherine had already played the original version. Uh, Rick Vaughn and I hadn't played it, but I knew the rules pretty well. We played it to a four way tie because there was literally. I mean, I think there was a, an eventual winner if we would have kept going, but it was like there was an equal number of there was an equal number of of human settlements and Fomorians. There was so so then there's a tiebreaker of well, who has the most uh, victory points, you know, or, or or who has yeah. Anyway, there was a tiebreaker that we were all tied for as well. And then it was, so we had a complete four way tie of the game. Fun. It was very interesting, except for I think there was somehow that I was ruled out of that four way tie. But <laughs> I can't remember how, but it was like Dang everybody it. won but me. I don't know how it was, but uh, but anyway, it's a really so like cool a game. Conspiracy baby, yeah. the arrival by Martin Wallace. It's really cool. And then for Cryptozoic, you know, I would support this game because then maybe they will, uh, you know, get more good titles and less shit games there you that, go. that they normally put out. So. I think that's it for what we've been playing. Let's go to an ad for Moon City and we'll be back with our main feature, RPGs. Well, we promised you a Moon City Con ad and here it is. You've got a little over one week. Get your tickets. The time is now, people. For all you procrastinators, don't put the ass in the astinator. <laughs> you procrastinator. <laughs> Buy your tickets now. Go to www.moonsitycon.com, pick up your tickets, buy one of my t-shirts I designed, and uh, just newly added, we're going to do some swag bags. You're going to get all kinds of cool free stuff, including an art print that I made that you can check out on the site. So once again, go to www.moonsitycon.com and get your tickets today. All right, we're back with our main feature of the episode. We're going to talk RPGs. Um, Starting off, I'd like to mention one uh, that we were contacted by Timeless Caverns. Uh, It's a company putting out their first Kickstarter right now. Um, They got in touch with me and wanted to know if we wanted to work with them on their Kickstarter. Um, You know, no money or anything, just like, hey, we're interested in your support. And I was like, okay, well, you know, what can we do? And uh, what's this all about? So they sent me their beta version of their new RPG called Fuel Priests and uh, a little press kit along with it and i checked it out and it's actually a really cool thing and i think one of the coolest things about it i'll talk a little bit about the system itself but the coolest thing about it to me is these kids are college kids that are that make up timeless caverns they've been working on this uh this game since they were in high school and now they've got it to a point where they're putting it on kickstarter and it just funded a couple of days ago so uh there should be about two or three days left on the uh, campaign whenever this episode drops so go check it out it's uh fuel priests by timeless caverns 
Uh, what it's about is it's called a uh, diesel. They call it a diesel punk thing, which you know is kind of a turn off to begin with. But what it's really all about is like airplanes in this post-apocalyptic alternate world where um, the corporations have taken over everything, and you basically are the faction, uh, reb- rebellious faction, leading the fight against them, and you are religious zealots to this deity called the maiden of oil and like the uh the backstory is that there was this freedom fighter and she was fighting back and her whole life she, they realized that she had like superpowers basically and she had oil running through her veins and she was like this great pilot and she went down as a martyr and when she when her plane exploded she literally like went up in this huge fireball that took out you know won this battle and then she ascended in front of all these witnesses into like heaven basically. And then she, now she has, you know, words to live by and stuff like she literally speaks through you if you believe in her. So these people are called fuel priests and they worship her. And if you worship her well enough and you do enough good deeds in battle of fighting against the corporations, then you can become a God yourself. You can die honorably and, and you cool. It's mechanically that if your character is going to end, it's like sooner than later, like, and when it does, you can perform one miracle. So you can do your big thing that makes you go down in history, you know. But the cool thing about it is it's all about your airplanes. Like there's uh, character creation. You cre- you create your person, but you also create your airplane. And you get to add different stats to the wings and different stats to the the uh, engine and, you know, the cockpit. And you get to do these different things and add different guns and whatnot on it. But it's all very streamlined. Like character creation shouldn't take more than 15, 20 minutes. You know what I mean? Depending on how in-depth you want to get in your backstory. And these traits that you give your, your, uh, plane are sort of like traits you give your D and D character, whatever they give you stats for different actions. And then it's got this really cool dice mechanic where you have a dice pool, depending on your stats and you roll your dice and they're predetermined. So then you have this set of dice to deal with. There's good results and bad results. Um, you can always take one of your good results when you're going to do an action and you can either place it, uh, just do it if, like, say you're on the ground, uh, it's a little bit different. But let's say you're in the air. You, you can take it and place it on a spot. And you're like, say, I'm going to bank left, hard left. To, I got a you know, dude on my tail trying to shoot me down. I'm going to bank hard left. I'm going to put that success on my wings or my cockpit, depending on which is uh, which the DM decides you know is the thing to do. Um, or you may have a bonus or something. I'll take that successful die and put that there, and I automatically do it. It works. you know, And then the, the DM will narrate what happens when when that you know takes place or you can take two unsuccessful dice and do that same thing and you still succeed but with a penalty so then the dm is free to choose what happens to you the sort of negative thing that happens to you you know and then um so it's literally an rpg with airplanes it's an rpg with airplanes that's pretty cool and you know you can get out of your airplane and stuff but you're 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 less you're much more proficient in the air so when you get out of the plane you take uh what's left of your die i think it's 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 less of a pool that you have to work with so you're you're encouraged to get back into your airplane and get the hell out of there so but the one thing about the beta was it was very uh loose on the backstory it gives you this really cool setup but then it's like after that do whatever you want with this you know it's like here's your here's your basic setup of this of this uh time and place now run with it so i immediately started having all these ideas about how to make this setting interesting and you know you know and Uh, take this framework that they've put down and really fill it in with other stuff. And immediately stuff started coming to mind. And I think that's when you know you've got a good setting for an RPG because usually you're doing your fantasy or your sci-fi or whatever, and the world is really laid out. Like in D&D, the world is pretty strict unless you change, you know, a bunch of things. And then your, you know, purists will say you're not really playing D&D because you've changed up the world and whatnot, you know. And this one, it seems to give you the freedom to really explore that idea and just kind of world build and whatnot so very interesting i really want to play it i got some little uh i got some little plane miniatures because you know me i'm going to make mm-hmm. everything tactical combat and everything so that's fuel priests i just want to mention that so go check them out on kickstarter it's funded and you'll get your copy i funded it uh or i backed it excuse me so uh, i was very happy to see that it actually funded it's pretty cheap i think 20 bucks gets you a soft uh bound printed version of the rule book and again, it's a really, they call it a pick up and play fast paced RPG. And I agree that I think it would be that, you know, you could read the rules in, in 25 minutes and be up and playing a game, you know, so check it out, everybody.
All right, I've done my good deed for the day. Now, on to our actual feature. So, we've played a lot of RPGs, babe. Yes, we have. We started out this whole hobby playing D&D together. Yes. People say you can't play D&D with two people. We I say, did. I say they're wrong. They I think are. it's actually pretty awesome to play D&D with two people. Thanks, you? baby. Me too. So, for this segment, let's play D&D with two people. Oh, Lord. Dun, 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 dun. Ooh, do you got Raquel? Well, why don't you open up that app I had you download? There's some dice. I see that. All right. So, pick your... <gasps> you gave me Raquel! Pick your weapons. So, there's your character sheet right there. So, can you explain a little bit about who Raquel is? So... Why you're so excited about that? Okay. So, Raquel was... While I get my DMs. My screen, very so. first D&D character. Gosh, how long ago was this? Three years ago? Mm, Four no, years ago? Much farther. Five like years seven ago? Seven years ago, I think. No, because Lily named her. Oh, that's right. So Lily's probably three or four. So probably five years ago. Probably five years ago. So, you know, Ben talked me into trying a a D and D round and, and I had no idea. I've never done any of this before. And so he hands me, you know, the character sheet and we're going through it and, and Lily actually was watching um Barbie and the Pop Star. I think Princess it's and what, the Pop Star. Yeah. yeah, Barbie, Princess and the Pop Star. And um and one of the girls on there's name is Raquel. And so Lily named my character Raquel. And so Raquel has a bit of a, a special place in my heart. She was what started all of this for me anyway. Um, she is, she was paladin, right, honey? Yep, she's a paladin. Yep, she's paladin and she wears purple and she's got a big, huge, um, is he a great sword? Yeah, but what oh, is Ishi? Oh, Ishi? Ishi. What is Ishi? Ishi is a giant riding lizard. Yes, lizard. Yes, huge lizard that he has started teleportation. started out as a little guy. You got him as a, as like when he was a little fellow. Like a little itty bitty. And he evolved into his full so size. So like she can ride him and he has teleportation. Like it's awesome. Yep. Yeah. So I had like the most kick-ass characters ever. And you know, I don't, I'm not the greatest D&D player. So I'm not very creative. So Ben had to DM weird for me. Like he would most time in D and D, you know, you here's your world. And, and now it's up to the characters to kind of, you know, decide what they want to do with the world. You know, I'm not very good at that or creative. So thankfully my husband is. And so he would always give me like, Oh, well here's this over here or this is over. People here. are going to find out how I do it. But what do you like about like, okay, so D and D, right? Yes. They're gonna see how I do it like firsthand here in a second. Oh, okay. So you haven't really played D and D in quite a while, it's right? It's been a long time. You've taken uh jaunts into other RPGs though. You played in our Star Wars RPG. Yeah. So what do you think about that? That was fun. Okay, Vaughn was DMing that. Yes, you guys have very different styles. Yes, very different. Very Talk different a little styles. bit about that. Like what about the different type of styles? Because that's your first time uh, really seeing a different DM at work. I no offense to Vaughn, but of course I prefer yours. So yeah. No, there wasn't any. I'm not trying to say pick who's better. I'm just saying like okay, systems wise and stuff. So you see different DMs. They definitely do it differently. I think Vaughn is a very traditional DM. See, I've I, only ever been. I've only ever played with you as a DM and Vaughn as the DM. Yeah, like that's my only so, experience. But we we play different styles. Very and different the, style. We, and well, and but also as a different game. Like we're playing D and D. Um, he's playing Star Wars. That Star Wars system. We played D&D 4th Edition and 5th Edition. 4th Edition is very mechanical and very video gamey. Um, I liked it a lot, but it was very system heavy and less on the role play. It was more about uh, tactical combat. He did a very good job explaining the area and the scenario and um, m- like making me get a picture in my brain of where we were at. Mm-hmm. You did that well as well, uh, but he, he did that as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, we're going to get into this a little bit more. But okay. So you've played Star Wars uh, RPG. Mm-hmm. You've played D and D a couple of different editions. Mm-hmm. You've also played a uh, scenario of Dread that I did mm-hmm. uh, in a you know Cthulhu Mythos setting. What do you think about that? That's the one with Vaughn and Craig. Yeah. That was super fun. Yeah, that was a one shot, and that was dread. That was using the uh, the Jenga tower. That was a crazy, crazy game. Yeah, that was a really cool game. I it did was a lot awesome. of. So now that gets into like. Um, the kind of straddling the line between like a murder mystery or a LARP 
and an RPG. That one was stressful. Like a LARP is called is a live action role playing game, right? It's like where you're actually acting out the things that you're doing. Um, I like to add a little bit of that to D and D and stuff too. I like having props and physical things that you need to do. And I think um, dread is cool because you have that physical aspect of pulling the, uh, you know, the Jenga tower. You have to pull pieces out in order to succeed at things. I like that. I like people getting up from the table and having to do things and, and just doing things that bring you into the actual world. So do you like that aspect? Or? I do. Okay. I do. I think I think by myself it might be a little different, but I definitely enjoyed it when I played with Vaughn and Craig when we did that kind of game. Okay, so you've done that. And then you've done a real murder mystery, which mm-hmm. I did. Um, I designed it completely from the ground up, and mm-hmm. I did it to be sort of an RPG. Um, there, I think murder mystery might be the closest thing. If you've never done an RPG, but some people who've never done played an RPG or even thought about wanting to might have went to a murder mystery dinner party or something. Mm-hmm. And if you've ever done that, that is the basic setup for a role playing game. Only it's it's the mixture of that and the live action role playing. Um, if you've enjoyed that, you might think about giving an RPG a try. Yep. Um, so I like them all. I like escape rooms. I like LARPs. I like RPGs. I like all those things that give you that that let you immerse yourself in what's going on at the time. Right. So right now we're going to ask a few more questions, but in the form of a little live action. D and D role play. You're putting me on the spot here. We did not discuss this. Hey, I'm putting myself on the spot. This is all improv. Oh Lord. So here we go. All right. Cue the music. And the thunder crash. You are. Like so, you, Raquela, just being recently reincarnated from your god Bahamut. You were a retired hero living in the equiline halls of the afterlife. After dying a glorious death, you've been called back to the planet by your god. To fulfill what purpose? You're not sure. He's kind of a cryptic god. He doesn't he tell is. you exactly what he wants. Um, but he did start you out as a lowly level six. Now, you don't really know that as a character, but I know that as a DM. So, you are a level six paladin. God, that sucks. You find yourself atop a windswept mountain. Not only a windswept mountain, it's called Windswept Mountain. That's the name of it. (laughs) And you're looking upon a giant imposing keep at the top of this windswept mountain. The rain is coming down and the wind is sweeping. You look at this giant imposing keep. It's in disrepair, but it's not quite a ruin because you see there are torches lit in sconces inside. And on either side of the giant wooden door that encloses the portcullis. Over your shoulder is the village of Graceville, where you just came from. That's where Bahamut plopped you down and told you to talk to a specific woman named Anita Richards. So you talked to Anita. Said you were sent on a mission from your god. Speak with her. She was pretty impressed by this. She told you but she could only think of one reason why you might have been sent to her. A blessing from the gods. She said her son, little Richard Richards, had gone missing about a year ago. And the entire village has been looking for him. He went up the forbidden windswept mountain following his lost dog. His dog ran off and he was sure that he went there. His dog's name was Keith. Keith Richards. So little Richard followed Keith up the mountain and was never seen again. People have looked everywhere except up here at the top of the mountain because legend has it that a lich by the name of Elvarastro lives in this keep. No one's ever seen Elvarastro, but from time to time undead things do come down from the mountain, pillage, burn, and kill people in the village. So it's a problem. They're pretty sure he exists. But nobody's going up that far to look for little Richard. Except a hero like you. So. You stand at the gate of the keep. You see the giant wooden door barring your entrance. There are some rain slicked stairs leading up the side. But there are uh, wooden spikes that 
block off the entrance to those. What do you do? Are there any low-hanging trees that I could climb up? No, there's just a few little scraggly brush there. Can I, do I have access to the burning torches? Uh, there's two on each side of the giant wooden door in front of you. So can I, are they removable? Can I grab them and like... Yes, uh, you can grab them. Okay. Well, first of all, let me just go ahead and do that because it always doesn't hurt to have a torch in your hand. Okay, you're going to dismount Ishii or not? Am I on Ishii? You are riding Ishii. Are you freaking kidding me? Yes. Oh, <gasps> fuck. We'll or just no, jump right kidding. over. Jump right over what? The, whatever the hell the keep is. I don't well, know. Well, the keep's hundreds of feet tall. Well, Ishii's fucking awesome. Ishii can climb walls. I know. Mm-hmm. Let's go, buddy. So, you spur your giant lizard forward. And we proceed with caution. Okay. As you reach about 10 feet towards the keep, Ishii stops and begins to shake his head back and forth. Oh, crap. He shakes his head back and forth, and he won't go any further. Crap. And you can feel a sort of electromagnetic tingling in the air. Oh, man. So now, um, at this point, I'm going to give you a chance to look over your player sheet. All right, so you're familiar with your character now, right? Well, you find yourself five feet away from the door with your giant riding lizard shaking his head back and forth. And as you're trying to determine what type of ill magic is uh, at hand here, the portcullis begins to lower. The rusty chains start rattling, and the door starts lowering itself open. In front of you. As it does, you hear an ominous sound like this. Coming from inside of the door. You going to do anything in particular? I'm going to use my paladin feature and as an action detect the location of any undead around me. You detect there's undead coming through the door at you right now. I can see him. Now you can. And you detect them with your magic as well. Well, if I can see them, I don't really need my magic. With your eyeballs. That's awesome. And roll initiative. Roll initiative. Son of a bitch. As you begin to back up and prepare yourself in a battle stance. (laughs) What'd you roll? A one. Nice. You see a zombie crawling out over the door as it lowers. Where's Ishii's stats? Um, I'll just wing them because I didn't give you Ishii's stats. Okay. So, the zombie rolls a one also. Oh, yes. So, pres- but you should have initiative bonus anyway. So I'm you, sure you, I do. You'll win. Yeah, you'll win because you have initiative bonus. Uh, it's whatever your uh, three. Uh, three, 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 three. Yeah, so you initiative go bonus three. Okay. So, you go first in this round. What do you do as this zombie clambers its way over the closing door? The door slams down finally completely open. You can see the interior. Draw and out my long sword. Okay. So you draw your long sword and you then attack? No, or maybe my great sword. Great sword probably. Two D better. six plus two or a two D or a one D eight plus two. Yeah. yeah. So two D six, six plus two. Yeah, so draw my great sword. Okay. Draw your great sword. <laughs> yep. Now you can go ahead and attack if you want. I need two D sixes. If you're within range, I think you probably are. He's you're five feet in front five of the door, and he's that, coming through the door. That so. should make sense, right? Yep. Okay. Roll your D twenty. It's been a while. Roll your D twenty. It's been a minute, babe. Hurry. Right. Okay, fifteen. Fifteen. Yeah, you hit him. Okay, good. All right. Did I hit him? Yeah, you hit him. All right. What'd you hit him for? I hit him for. Let's see, six plus two, so eight. Eight. Nice. So he, uh, oh, it even says five feet on there, so I'm yeah. good. Yeah, you're good. It's close range. So you slash his chest open, and he stumbles backwards. But being undead and mindless, he comes forward. <laughs> and he attacks you. <laughs> what did he roll there? I can't see it. A two. Nice. He tries to slam you. He gets a five, so I don't think he hits you. So what do you do next? Stand back, and I try to assess the situation. Okay, so you're, you're holding. I'm, I'm kind of holding. I'm kind of looking around. I have the torch in my hand. You Ishii's, just cut his chest wide open. Oh, he is hurt, isn't he? Okay, let's just go ahead and fuck him up some more. Okay. All right, so you attack the zombie. 20! You got a natural 20, so that's an automatic hit. Whoop, whoop. So you rolled your you roll max damage. Damn right, 
idea. So whatever your do, for, two were, d six will yep, do. Two d six plus two. So the 14. the match be fourteen. So he is now. You slice him and decapitate him Ew. with a great swing of your great sword. Ew. And you're like, I think I kind of remember how this is done. Oh, yeah. You wipe the blood off onto your cape and resheathe your sword. Walking over this foul creature's body to the entrance of the porticullis. You see a ballroom size foyer dimly lit by some uh, sconces along the edge. I can see in dim lit like it's daylight. Alright, well that being said, you then see a small creature scuttle out of the light and into try to hide in a shadow next to the doorway. Can Ishii sniff him out? You can tell him to. Is he coming in now, or is he still scared, shaking nope. his head? Nope, Ishii's still standing five right, feet in front of the door. let's have Ishii try and go sniff him out. Well, Ishii will not, doesn't seem to want to come past five feet He still the doesn't want to come. What a freaking weenie. You do have a way around this. I know, I could teleport his ass. You could try anyway. Let's try teleporting his ass. You try teleporting his ass, and in a flash, <laughs> with only the thought of it, Ishii appears... Beside you, inside of the. You're keep. done right now. Sniff him out. So Ishii looks around, long forked tongue going in and out of his mouth. And he darts over to the corner. Next thing you know, he brings back a small goblin, oh. holding him by the scruff of his neck. Should I give him my And the my goblin sock? is kicking and screaming <laughs> and saying, Hey, put me down. But what is this thing? Is it going to eat me? Oh, don't let it eat me, please. Don't let it eat me. Uh, okay, let's ask him um, what the hell's going on here. What do you mean? I- what the hell's going on? I'm just trying to mind my own business, and you come in here and get broke down the door, and now I've got this thing. Like, put have, me down. Have you seen little Richard, a little boy missing with his dog? Uh, yeah, may- maybe. I don't want this to be the last thing I ever tell anybody. Tell this thing to put me down. I will put him. I will have him put you down if you tell me where you've seen the boy and the dog. Uh, the boy was here. So was the dog. Where's here? Here in the keep. Which, Over Astro's keep. Which direction? Which direction? It only goes up. Oh. Okay. See these stairs? They all go up. Okay. All right. That's that's fair enough. I, I've been watching you come up the hill, you know, and, uh, you know, uh, I could be of help. What can you do? Well, I would not like to meet under better circumstances than this. Okay, Ishii, put him down. Stop looking at his face and put him down. Oh, God. Is this poisonous? No, you're fine. Ugh. Well, I guess nice to meet you. In your name? My name's Poyo. Did you mean to say Dobby? No. Oh. Who's Dobby? <laughs> I'm Poyo. Poyo, got it. It means chicken somewhere. <laughs> Poyo. <laughs> well, hello, Poyo. I am Raquela. Hello. And you mentioned wanting to be of service. What can you do? Well, you know, living in a lich's castle is not a whole lot of fun. So uh, when I saw somebody coming up the hill farther than I've ever seen anybody coming up the hill... I got kind of excited. Took you a while. You had to stop in the middle and take a nap or something. I I didn't think it was going to take you that long. Uh, I wrote you a little something. Now, I got to get some things together. So I'm going to run to the kitchen and I'll be back. Read this. And he hands you a beat up scroll. What do you got there? I have a little uh, scroll tied up with my hair tie. (laughs) First off, you look hot in that plate armor. <laughs> Second, what is the most memorable thing that happened for you in the RPG game? All right, so now we've P- got another question a that has been... Oh, there's a PS? PS, if you're reading this, I'm dead. Please clear my browser history. <laughs> Disregard that last part. I didn't think I was going to survive this interaction. I'll be back. Oh, Lord. All right. I kind of assumed you would kill him. So, uh, oh, really? Yeah, you kill everything. You rarely, we rarely do any diplomacy in oh, games. Oh, that's true. So, um, 
answer that question. What so was what again? What was the most memorable thing that happened for you in an RPG game? Um, I'd have to say the golden egg. Okay, explain that. So, Bahamut, originally, my god for Rakella, he does not like black dragons. He only likes. He is a big giant silver dragon whenever yes. he wants to be that's yes. kind of his one of his forms and and he has given Raquela the uh the power and the blessing to be able to change into a white dragon as needed i'm sure she's not now and with this six level six character but anyway um so he's got a thing for black dragons and he you know he said if i help a black dragon that he will unbless me and be mad at me so ben he pulls on my heartstrings a little bit and he uh, finds a mama black dragon that has an egg and he literally puts a golden Easter egg in the middle of the freaking board and I had to save the golden Easter egg because there was a baby black dragon in there. I couldn't let it die. Yeah, I there couldn't were people kill trying it. to kill the and people trying to kill, kill the, baby. the mother. The, and yeah, then, yeah, the mom and then the Easter and then the baby eggs over there. And and I'm not supposed to help the black dragons, but I couldn't not help her because she's a mama and there's her baby. And so then I got then Bahamut was way pissed off at me, but it was totally worth it because I helped the mama and the black and the baby. So there was a gold egg with an actual baby dragon inside. There was of her. actually <laughs> a baby dragon inside of the golden egg. Yes. Yeah, that that goes to you know illustrate my point that I like to do little things like that, like those the props and whatnot, like. Like the scrolls the scroll. and uh, stuff like that. You yeah. Know, I think that brings people into the game. Absolutely does. So um, that's question number one that you found out in this quest. And you get 50 experience points. Yay! All right. Now let's continue our story. So as Pollo runs out of the room uh, towards the little side room that he said was the kitchen, uh, you look around and you see that he, uh, except for that one side exit of this room, He was right. There's two sets of winding stairs that just appear to go up from here. So, what do you do? I'm not waiting on his ass. I'm I'm heading upstairs. You're not waiting on him? Well, do I need to wait on him? It's up to you. Well, he needs to hurry up then if he wants you to wait on him. Okay, are you going to just stand there or are you going to follow him or are you going to go upstairs? What are you going to do? I'm going to follow him and tell him if you want to be a service, you better hurry the hell up because I'm going upstairs. Okay. So, you walk in towards uh, where he exited the room. Uh, you enter this small room that has is full of cabinets. Uh, it's very dusty. And it's got old pots and pans on top of uh, wood cooking stoves. And you hear a bunch of rattling underneath one of the cabinets. And you look over and you see a little goblin ass sticking out. <laughs> and he's rattling around. And he comes out with a big... Iron key. He says, I stashed this here quite a while back. Thought I might need it for just such an occasion. Come on, follow me. All right, let's go. So he exits that room. With the big key in his hand. And he heads up the stairs. So you and Ishii follow him. Absolutely. He heads up to uh, about the fourth floor. Quite a few. Why don't you give me a uh, perception check? Seven. That's a two. Huh? Oh, the light's glaring on it. That's Looks a like two, a seven woman. From this Never angle. lie to the DM. I'm sorry, it was an accident. Uh, do I have any perception? Yeah. P E R. Where is it? I don't know. Oh. Anyway, you failed it. Okay. So, <laughs> so you don't notice Three. anything. Uh, you notice that these are old, uh, slimy, gross, slick steps. But I'm sure Dobby can tell me out. something. He's running pretty fast. He's skipping steps. He's got short little legs, but he's flying up these stairs. So you guys get up there to about the fourth floor of what appears to be like 40. And uh, he stops and he looks around. This room is divided into four different uh, rooms. Or you think, because there's a hallway that goes down and it bisects bisected by another hallway. And there's doors on each of these uh, four quadrants. He looks around when you guys get to the top of the stairs and he puts his finger to his mouth in the classic shh position and he waves you forward to follow him quietly. My sword is prepared. Okay. Now, Ishii, 
doesn't know how to be quiet very well. So he's just flopping his big ass to this hallway that he barely fits down. Can we tell him to teleport his ass back out? I don't want you to do anything. Hmm. No, I think sometimes we need him. Okay. So you've got a giant lizard behind you that barely fits in this hallway. You've got a tiny little goblin sneaking in front of you, and you're in between. He looks, he gets to the intersection of the two hallways. He looks right, and he looks left, and he doesn't doesn't make anything, any uh, indication for a second. And then he sprints across the hallway, and he motions you forward. So you cross, you cross the hallway. Yeah, just teleport Ishii's ass back outside. He's going to cause trouble. I can feel it. So next thing you know, snap a finger, Ishii's gone. Ishii's outside waiting on me. All right. When you get to the other side of the hallway, there's a door with a metal grate. And at that point, Poyo sticks the giant key that he had into the lock, twists it, and the large iron door creaks open. It makes lots of noise while it does it. He's trying to, you know, stop every inch or two. It's making a lot of noise. He gets it open. And you look in the door. It's a very low light, but you can see like I daylight. Can see. You see about a 10-year-old boy, Good. maybe 11, sitting in the corner, hugging his knees is, is, on a small pile of hay. Is Keith in there too? You look around, you do not see you do not see a dog. But you see this little boy. Okay, that's good enough. Okay, what do you do? Um, I call out his name and tell him I'm I am here from his mommy has uh, sent me to find him. He's not very responsive at first. He looks up at you with dull eyes, and he just points over to um a little footstool with a book sitting on top of it, right next to the door on your left. Okay. I look over, see what it is. You look over there, it's a leather-bound book. And it says? It says nothing on it. It's got a strap with a button on it. Okay. I open it. Okay. You open the book. Make a perception check. 17 plus 3, so 20. Okay. You open the book, you feel... Another tingling like you felt outside. That electromagnetic type feeling. Great. And you look in the book, and it appears to be a small boy's handwriting. And it looks like a diary. And you flip through, and it shows numbers of days on there. And uh, you get to about day 92... And you see this written. If you could play an RPG in any setting, what would it be? Like any setting, like in like... Anything you want. Like an RPG, like you could have, like there exists a uh, Pride and Prejudice uh, RPG now. Oh. There's, you know, there's anything you could think of. What would be the one that you would want to try? Hmm. Like, you don't really like post-apocalyptic stuff, right? No, I right? don't. Like, you like fantasy, I think. I do. Do you like futuristic stuff? No. Not really, okay. No. So, is fantasy your one, or is there anything else you can think of doing this I type of prejudice thing? Prejudice would be fun. Now, see, I, I'm wondering, like, that that was on Kickstarter just recently, and I was wondering, like, what what do you do? Like, was the scenarios just, you know, you're having a ball and everybody has to get ready? That sounds infinitely boring to no, me. No, Vaughn and I would freaking love that game. I know, but I don't get it. But you guys do. I I understand. So you that think would be like fun. Victorian I also era like fantasy too? What about horror? Like, do you like? That'd huh? be great. Like Victorian horror? That'd be so awesome. Okay, we've done Cthulhu, you know. So like, yeah. That's, but yeah. like Jack the Ripper, like Victorian yeah. times. Yep. I figured that would be something you want. Okay, that's your answer. All right, so you've got the diary in your hand, and the little boy looks fearful of you. Do I have any chocolate in my pocket or anything? That's highly unlikely. 
I'm a girl. Girls <laughs> usually always have chocolate stash somewhere. Um, yeah, I'm gonna say... Uh, yeah, you do. Do you want to try to be cool and do a sleight of hand? Pull it out? Like yeah. Like a magic trick? Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, then give me a dexterity check. Are you kidding me? What'd you roll? Big fat fail. A fail? Oh. You reach into your pocket and all you find is a handful of empty wrappers. And you pull them out like you're pulling a rabbit out of a hat and they just fall to the floor. And the, you see a tear roll down the child's Aww. face. <laughs> That's so sad. So about that time, Poyo's like, I don't really know what's happening here, but uh, if we're going to go, now's the time. Because... If Elva Rostro finds out that I'm here doing this, it's going to be big, big, okay. big trouble. Okay. So, uh, I'm try- can I try talking to the boy again? And mm-hmm. Okay, so let's try talking to the boy again. Tell okay. him his mama sent me, and then I'm going to bring him home safe to his mama. Okay. Um, why don't you give a charisma check? I ain't doing so hot on these checks, baby. That's not bad. Um, 15, and what's my adder? I don't know, whatever on your charisma. I don't know. It says score 13, modifier, plus one, yeah, save, plus, plus five. Plus one, then. Okay, so, so 16. 16. Yeah, you, uh, what do you do? What do you tell him to c- try to convince him? I just come said that. You. What did you say? I said that his mama sent me. Oh, sorry. And I'm here to take him back to his mama so he can be safe and sound. Yeah, his eyes get kind of bright, but you still see a lot of fear and he, he starts to raise up, but you see, like, he seems very weak. Can I... Will he let me pick him up? Mm, I don't know. Are you going to try? I can. Can I teleport? If I have Ishii come back in, can Ishii teleport him out? Ishii can't teleport anybody with him. Oh, okay. Hmm. Oh, boys like lizards. <laughs> you think he'd be scared of Ishii? I don't know. Hmm. Mm, okay, let's see if he'll let me pick him up. Okay, you go to pick him up, and he freaks out, and he starts yelling. Oh, no, no, no. And Poyo's like, shh, 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 no, no, what are no, you no, doing? No, no. What are you doing? Okay. Just come with me. Everybody, okay. come with me. Does he get up? Come, child. And the kid starts getting up slowly, and he puts his hand out for help. I help him. You help him up. You don't try grabbing at him. <laughs> and so, you've got the child... What are you going to do with him? Are you going to position him in front of you, behind you? What are you doing? Um, you want me to hold his hand? Yeah, you've got to hold his hand right now. Okay. Uh, it feels very bony. Oh, poor baby. Like there's barely any flesh on it. Poor baby. Let's put him in front of me so I can see what's happening with him. Okay. Now, he's sort of tall for, you know, a 10-year-old, but um, very skinny. And he looks to be very weak. So, you guys exit the room. So I don't you can- have any drinks or food or nothing on me. Oh yeah, you've got rations and stuff. Can I give him some? Can I give him something? Sure. Or do I have time for that? Probably not. Sure, you could if you wanted to. Like just leave something to drink real fast, just yeah, like a just super last fast. Last time drink. you went for chocolate and you just came up empty-handed. So. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, you offer him some some food quickly, and Poyo's like, "This is not a picnic, people. Come on, we gotta go." Okay. All right. Give and us as you guys food. exit the right. door, you turn the corner, and you see a dog. At the end of the hallway. Mm. Is that Richard? Is that Keith? Does he get excited? Does he say anything? The boy definitely does have a does get excited whenever he sees the dog, and a little smile creeps on his face. At the end of the hallway, the dog begins to growl, and you can see that there's like white foam coming from his mouth. Oh. And Keith begins to bark at you. <laughs> He's got rabies. And then Keith also begins to grow a second head out of the side of oh his neck. Oh, my God. And you look to your right. There's a plaque on the wall down one of the directions that you didn't take when you came in this room. There's a plaque. It's in Elvish. Can you read Elvish? I believe so. I'm an elf. I certainly hope so. You can. The plaque says, What do you like and dislike about a DM? We sort of... Uh, Talked about this a little bit. Like, yeah. what do you think? You don't have a lot of experience with different DMs. I really don't. I like, I like that you kind of go towards like your people. So you're not just like, well, this is the way I'm going to play. If you don't like it too, ba- too damn bad, you, you kind of 
um, make the game around your skill set of your people and what they're comfortable with. Of the players? Yes. Okay, yeah. That's I am definitely uh, the fun type of DM. I want to DM so that everybody has a good time. Mm -hmm. I never have killed a character unless it was a character that was only there to be killed. to be killed, yeah. Um, Some people think that's bullshit and that's not how you play. Vaughn kills characters. Uh, Yeah, Vaughn is a traditionalist in RPGs. What he does is he sets out a, a world and you just walk around in it. And whatever happens to you is tough shit. Like if you fall down the stairs and you die, you fell down the stairs and you died. That to me is not that fun. I mean, I enjoy that that type of game. I enjoy playing in that type of game. It's not fun for me to create a game like that because I create games specifically for the story, specifically for mm-hmm. you to experience a story. And I also do a thing called railroading, which some people don't like because my opinion is I did all this work on this thing, on this storyline, right? And I made all these characters. And one way or another, you're going to see all this shit that I did. Mm -hmm. So there's some guys that are like, oh, I made this quest over here. And then, but you didn't go that way. So you'll never see it. Well, my thing is, okay, the quest was to the north when I originally set it up. But if you decide to go to the west, well, guess what's going to magically change direction? (laughs) That stuff's going to all happen over here. No big deal. You don't know that behind the scenes, but I know that. And I didn't waste a whole bunch of time prepping. Some people say that's bullshit. I don't care. That's to me what makes for uh, a fun game. Mm -hmm. Um, So there's definitely different styles of DMing. I have my style. You know, Mm -hmm. Vaughn has his style. I've played uh, online games with other guys who have, you know, a mix of both of those. You know, they like to get, some people like to get really into the minutia about every step you take is then analyzed about, you know, this might happen. How are you proceeding? What is your formation? And I do a little bit of that too, because that's kind of important for storytelling, but some people get really granular about that, you know. I'm glad that you don't because I don't think I'd like that. Okay. Well, I did when we started out. Remember, like, every step you would take, it would be like we would map out every single. Yeah, I didn't you know, like it. And that's, you know, that's a little different. I've kind of grown from then. So I'm definitely a narrative type DM. So you're saying that's kind of what you like. I like it. Okay. So also underneath that on the plaque, it reads privy. Like the toilet? Yeah. So you look that you look right and you see a door down at the end. You look left and it's a door it's a hallway, but it just leads to a window with a giant iron wrought iron crossbars on it. And then in front of you is a dog. Behind you is another window and the door that you just came out of. Um Dude the kid's not excited about the double headed dog now, is he? Can no, he looks a little bit Can I uh, can I leave that dog there now? Well, He's he's a, right now shaking his head around as another head grows out of the side of his neck. Oh. We can't just say screw it and run run run. Well, he's in front of the he's in front of the stairs. Oh crap! Wasn't there two entrances? Nope, there was one entrance. Uh, mm, okay, what's in one of those doors? Well, one says privies. Which is bathrooms. Don't oh, really need to go to the bathroom. Okay. What do the other ones say? That's it. That's the only door you see. The other one is the one you just came out of, which was a cell. Oh, well, crap. I have to go face the dog. You're making me feel like I should go to the bathroom. You're about to get attacked by a giant dog. If you don't do make a decision in three seconds. All right, let's go attack the giant dog, I guess. Roll initiative. And I got... 17 plus so I got a 20. You got a 20? Yeah. You will go first. I feel bad for killing his dog. Yeah, you, you've you got your sword drawn already. But um, what are you doing? Are you attacking him? I, I, I'd rather, can I just save him and make him not be crazy and mouth full of white foam and try to eat me? How would you go about I doing that? I have no idea. Well, then you can't. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You're not helpful. What about what about Dobby? Does he have any ideas of how the dog Dobby can is be not saved? around. Dobby is nobody. Uh, Poyo. Yeah, Poyo looks scared shitless. He's like, <laughs> "Is that dog? Is that dog again?" And he runs off to the bathroom. He runs to the bathroom. Mm-hmm. He's hiding in the bathroom. You open the door and you don't see him anymore. The fucking dog. So you're about 10 feet away from him now. I Are you going to close the crit. distance? Are you running at him? Yeah. You crit the dog? 
Mm-hmm. All right. Well, right as you're running towards him, the second head fully pops out of the side of his neck. And so what's your damage there? Um, 14 still? Oh, I don't know. Well, didn't you oh, attack yeah. with the same yeah. thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, okay. So the uh, the one, the two, the second head pops out fully. And you slice right in between them. And you open up a giant wound in the dog. Oh, and you hear sorry. the boy, you hear the boy let out an eek behind you. I'm sorry. And the eek just gets louder and louder and louder. And it starts turning into a scream. So what the hell is I supposed to do? I feel what bad. do you do? I feel bad for slicing the kids. Well, what do you do about it? I don't know. I don't know. Do I so, have right now, the dog. Can I not kill the dog? dog raises both his heads up, shakes himself off, and he comes at you. So he's two-headed dog, and he is going to bite you. He makes two bite attacks. The first attack is a two. It misses. Second attack is a 12. So that's actually a 16. Missed me. He missed you? Mm Mm-hmm. All right. So the boy's scream begins to die down a little bit, and it sounds guttural. You can hear it almost like he's sobbing behind you. I feel horrible. Okay, what do you do? I want to save the dog. Okay. Well, I want the dog not to eat me. How would you possibly go about me. doing that? Uh, it won't work by cutting him up. I'll promise you that. No. There's nothing around anywhere. From there's needed. bathrooms. And there's <laughs> there's a cell door, and there's stairs on the other side of the dog. Okay, go to the bathroom, I guess. Okay. Don't so turn my back. I'm not turning back. my back. So you're backing towards Just, the bathroom. I'm backing up, keeping my keeping eye, eye on, the dog. on the dog. Okay, so you can move. What's your speed? Um, thirty. Okay, yeah, you can get there. It's about it's only about ten feet down the hallway. Okay. So you get to the bathroom door, you open it up. It's got a cool little crescent moon cut into the wood door. You smell the privy smell, but it mm. doesn't smell like it's been used lately. And inside the privy, you open it up, and it's actually pretty good size stone enclosure. Uh, you see Poyo standing in the corner, shaking, and on the privy toilet, you see the bones. Of a person that is keeled over whilst in the form of taking a big shit. He had a heart attack. It is a it is a skeleton sitting upon the throne. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> is it it? Well, that's what you see. Oh. Okay. I asked what's his face? What's the what is problem? Is? What's wrong? Uh, there's a crazy death dog out there in the hallway. Is there a way to save him to make him not a death dog? No, he's a death dog. He's not Little Richard. Or he, he, Keith was Richard. Keith. he was Keith. He was Keith. There's no reversal. There's no elixir. He was Keith before that kid did that to him. Oh, and he slaps his finger. He slaps his hand over his face. The kid did it. Mm, I, mm, uh, Speak up, Poyo. Uh, I think you're about to find out. Oh, God. And he points to, towards the doorway. So you look out there, and the kid's sob that was the scream that turned into a sob has started turning into a slow laugh. <laughs> 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 and as you look, little Richard's skin begins to fall from his bony visage, and a skeleton pokes through, leaving only the ragged of his clothes behind and he grows in stature and he becomes about eight feet tall awesome and little Richard calls forth his pet and the death dog comes to his side and little Richard speaks to you and says what, what did they, they tell you in my village did they send you here to save me <laughs> Took them long enough. I've been waiting them for them to send me some prey for a while now. They thought I came here on accident. I came here to learn from the old one. 
Little did I know his untimely death would occur so fast. I've had to learn much, but as soon as I found his secret, becoming immortal, I'm now unstoppable. <laughs> so, for yourself. Yeah, see? Elvarastro's on died on the throne right there. This kid took over. He was gonna string me up on the torture machines if I didn't get you this far. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, you're welcome, I guess. But, uh, I would like for us to both make it out of here alive, so if you could just, like, do the hero thing and kill him, please. Alright. Initiative. So you roll initiative. You're facing off against a lich and a death dog. Oh, god dang it. Lich rolls a 15. Uh, Lich goes first. (laughs) Alright. So. The Lich attacks. He steps forward. And. He's going to cast a spell at you. He raises his hand. Oh man. He's got quite the spells. Alright. He's going to. He's going to cast Blight at you. He. Okay, let's see. You make a, must make a constitution save. Make a constitution save. Should give You should have a save on your thing. Alright. So you probably made it. 15 plus 18. Is that your save? Save is only 3. I rolled a 15. Okay. So you, you did. So you saved it. Okay. So he did not cast a blight. Woohoo. But he has advantage on saving through. Oh, okay, there's more. Okay, so now it is the Death Dog's turn. The Death Dog is going to come at you with his double bite attack. He rolls a 19. Oh, crap, he got me. All right, he does. Not too much damage. Oh, okay, so that's three damage. Then he bites at you again. And he probably... Oh, that's 15. Yeah, he hit you again. Four. Oh, that's good. Seven damage. So he did ten damage. And the lich just smiles. Okay. As the death dog. Chewing on your leg. Awesome. What okay. do you do? Let's go for the lich. Great sword. I Great don't have sword. any spells that are worth a damn. So. Okay, well you'll have to disengage from the dog. The dog is on top of you right now. Oh, uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Well then I'll just... Let's just hit him first then. Okay. Since he's You've already, already attached to my leg. Yeah, he's already got eight damage. Um, 11, and then what's my, what is that? Yeah, you're gonna hit him. I hit him? Yeah, you hit him. Okay. And then, it's 5 plus 2, so 7. Alright, um, yeah, he's taking another 7 damage. Nice. So he's not dead, but he's bleeding profusely. Good. And now the Lich is going to attack you again. His big move is a paralyzing move. He moves forward next to his dog. And he's going to use an action to... Well, he can't do that because that costs two actions. That's sad. But he does have paralyzing touch. So he moves towards you. And he attempts to place his hand, his bony hand, upon you. And I think he does. Yes, he does. Because he's got a plus 12 to hit. Um, He's going to do 10 damage to you. 10 cold damage. And you must succeed on a dexterity 18 saving throw. Or be paralyzed for one minute. Did Ooh. not get it. So you are now paralyzed. You will not have an action this turn. Now the dog. Uh, You can repeat the saving throw at the end of your turn. I mean, actually, you'd be done for several turns, actually. Okay. The dog attacks you 16, then 4, so he does 5 damage, then he missed you. No, 5 damage. He got 16 because he has plus 4. Oh, uh-uh. So he did another 5 damage. And then you need to make a dexterity check, or a uh, constitution saving throw. 18. Nope. Nope, you still can't move. So the Lich then has two moves. He's going to do frightening gaze upon you. He fixes you with his deathly gaze. 
you must succeed on an 18 wisdom saving throw. Or become frightened for one minute. Uh, nope, I only got 15. Ooh. Damn, and you would be in game. So, yeah, he did that. That cost both of his actions. Then the dog attacks. He's going to hit you too, because that's a 21. The dog gets you for a 3. And another one for 6. So the dog is just chewing. He's chewed through your armor at this point. Awesome. It's down to your leg. Now you make a dexterity or a constitution saving throw to try to get rid of this lich's curse. Nope, only 14. Jeez, Louise, you're going to get killed in the bathroom right next to the dead lich. He attacks you with his disrupt life. Each living creature within 20 feet of the lich must take a DC 18 constitution saving throw. Got it. Oh, you got it. Otherwise, that was going to be bad news. Now make your other saving throw. Did not Still get did it. did not get it. All right. Well, let's fast forward to the end of this thing. Let's say that he killed you. <laughs> That's what it was looking like. <laughs> so what would you think? Fun? Not fun? It's always fun. You're I just like dying over there. You got to go to sleep. Okay. So... That is our little role playing segment for now. We just did a little bit of good job. Did a little bit of live play, um, just to get a feel for like what we do typically if we're going to play like two players. This is something like that. Yep, it is. Just a cool little scenario. Me yawning and everything. Yeah, you yawning every two (laughs) seconds really, really makes it sound exciting to everyone. (laughs) Oh god, is it over yet? (laughs) So anyway, um. That's all we're going to do for our RPG segment right now. Like I said, I think this is going to be continued because your aunt has uh, uh, requested to play a game this Sunday. So I'm going to run a little D&D session then. We need to make it happen because they're going to be moving soon. Yep. And they've never played any RPGs at all. And they've, for some reason, gotten a wild hair up their ass to to want to try. Yep. So I'm going to do that. Um, We're going to run a Fuel Priest. Do you guys do Raquela? We'll see. Uh, I'm going to run a Fuel Priests one, and I've also been wanting to do, I don't know, I've been wanting to do a Scooby-Doo RPG for quite oh, a while. that'd be fun. So I might do a one-shot pretty soon of that. So you'll probably be hearing more about RPGs in the future, so I hope you like that. We might get a little bit more in-depth in the history of RPGs and stuff uh, at a later date. But this time was just kind of like Do you a, ever want to not be the DM? Yes, I like not being the DM um, better, You're really actually. good at it. I like DMing, too, but... Um, I enjoy playing just as much. I like it on both sides. So I enjoy the, the preparation and stuff for DMing more than I enjoy the actual thing because I have expectations of what people are going to do. And when they don't do them, sometimes I'm like, oh man, you're missing out on the cool thing. You know what I mean? But like I said before, I always try to steer you towards the cool thing. Yeah, anyway. you do. You know, so that's it for our segment. Now we're going to move on to everyone's real favorite segment, IRN. All right, here we are, babe. What's your IRL? Let's get you to bed as soon as possible. You've got a early flight tomorrow, right? Yes, I have to be up at 3, and I have to be uh, on the road for a 40-minute traveling for uh, my flight leaves at 6 o'clock in the morning. You're not even speaking pure, you're not even speaking English at well, this no, point. Well, no, I have to get up at 3. And so <laughs> for a 40-minute traveling. Well, I have to get up at 3, blah, 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 blah. 40 minutes to Springfield. My flight leaves at 6 o'clock in the morning. Like, there you I, go. My God, it's so early. Yeah. So early. Like, I set my alarm. Oh, my God, alarm. it's almost 9 o'clock. No, it's um 10, <laughs> after 10. All right, well, let's do this thing. What's yeah. your IRL? Is yeah. that your IRL? Yeah, I, I have work trip. I got to get up early. I have to wake up so early. Um, my work trip, I'm going to be spending uh, some time in the uh, showroom uh, learning how to sell light bulbs for the next two so days going instead from, of buy light bulbs. You're going from being a manager to a lowly peon. Yeah, I don't know why, but the the boss guys said that they think it's a good idea for us purchasing bitches to uh, learn the counter, I guess. Yeah. So, yeah. Sounds like a downgrade to Whatever. me. Whatever. Yeah, good thing it's only two days. You know what? I'll you be probably, getting good food while I'm yeah, there. Yeah, you'll get some good barbecue and such yep. while you're there. So that'll yep. be fun. Yeah, that'll be fun. But other than that, that's really all I got for IRL. Okay. Well, my IRL, I'm going to be short and sweet. I'm going to recommend a movie. There's a movie that I watched not knowing anything about it, and it was really cool. It's uh, starring Nicolas Cage and some other folks. I can't remember right now because I never do any research or have any prep. 
but it's called Mom and Dad. And I don't really want to spoil the movie, but I will tell you the premise is basically um, something happens and all of a sudden all parents want to kill their children. They don't want to kill anybody else's children. They just want to kill their own children. And the biological imperative to uh, protect your kids and the strength that that has, you know, you've seen mothers lifting cars and whatever to save their babies. That is exactly proportionally the the level to which they want to kill their kids, as bad as most people want to protect their kids. So very interesting setup. It becomes sort of like a zombie movie, only the zombies are your parents. It's pretty cool. Um, so I recommend that. It's very twisted and different. So I guess that's it for IRL. All you got to, honey? It's kind of been a long episode already. So we're going to wrap it up here. That's going to be it for episode 19 of the Not Safe for Worker Placement podcast. I hope that everyone... Oh, man, what is going on? Andrew, I, I, I thought that you... I told you not to put him in a box. I, I must have packed him. You packed him? I guess I did. Oh, my God. He's I'm found sorry. his way in here? I'm sorry. All right. Maurice, what do you think of the new digs? What? I, I'm... I'm not gonna speak for you, man. You gotta tell the people what you. Oh, okay, yeah. What What do you think about it? You've been hiding in the game room, yeah. Okay, well, let us know what you think. Ah. I could have never guessed. I like how you held your hand up to the microphone like you were holding Maurice in your hand. What do you mean? I was holding Maurice in my hand. That it's was, called space work, man. It's that called was adorable. space work, guys. He literally held his hand up. Like he, he it's had I have his hand a tiny on live the table. sentient meeple in my hand. He had his hand on the table and he picked up his hand and he held it close up to the mi- to the microphone and then and then he pushed his button like he was holding Maurice. It's called role playing. To- <laughs> <laughs> Take a page from my book. Jeez, you're spoiling the magic, Maurice. Don't no, don't feel bad. It's okay. It's okay. All right. We'll see you all next time <laughs> Bye, for episode guys. 20 of the Not Safe for Worker Placement podcast, yes. where we'll talk about some such other thing having to do with board games. Yes. Bye. Bye. No, we've never done this before. <laughs> all right, I have a surprise for you. Oh. Choose your weapon wisely. Oh, I want that one. Is this going to replace the alcohol? Mm, I guess. You don't, oh. you don't ever want alcohol anymore, so <laughs> I don't even offer it. Thanks, baby. Oh. Chocolate is. Give me a test one, too. Testies. One, two. One, two. Testies. I feel like I'm low in my own ears, but I don't know what I sound like to your ears. Well, move that around however you want, however you have to, to not be bumping it all the time. If you hit it every time you've moved. Well, you got to be at the microphone, babe. Like, oh, you I need can't to be, even feel. You need to be much closer to the microphone. Much closer. You, your, your body. Your, I know, your mouth. I'm moving yeah, it. Okay. Just put it to where you can move around and not, you know what I mean? But well, I can't help with the damn things all the way over here. Can I go like this? Yeah, you do whatever you want. Just put it to where you don't hit it. Goddamn right, I can do whatever I want. How's that? Is that any better? A lot better. Okay. Okay. So give me test one, two. That's fine, too. Okay. Maybe we'll just wait till your mouth not full. Mmm. I picked the white chocolate one. It was really good. What was yours? Milk chocolate? I guess so. It was chocolatey. Chocolatey chocolate time. I have a sip of your beer.